imagine a world free of poverty, where people work in peace and partnership to deliver a shared prosperity in harmony with nature. People from all over the world came to Rio and Brazil in 2012, and they declared this the future we want. They made a plan, a three-year plan facilitated by the UN to have the Sustainable Development Goals part of a UN agenda by the end of 2015. Like many others, I set off to New York um, to make my contribution to the process. I was hosted by Professor Jeffrey Sachs in Columbia University in the Art Institute. Uh, I was very privileged uh, to work for the UN Sustainable Solutions Network, which had a formal mandate from the UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon to provide a non-governmental input into the post-2015 process. This input was mainly academic and scientific. These inputs from non-governmental and governmental sources were eventually, they were summarised and, and, and collected, um, they were summarised by the end of 2012, or by the end of 2014. The negotiations, for, the negotiations started in January 2015 in earnest. I took part in those negotiations as a member of the UN Major Group for Science and Technology. This was an amazing experience. You had representatives from women's groups, from youth and children, from farmer groups, from academics, the private sector, all had a desk at the table, all alongside the diplomats from 193 nations. The negotiations were co-chaired by very skillful and the very brilliant ambassador of, of Ireland, Donoghue, and also the ambassador of Kenya, Kenya um, Kamau. Right? The negotiations went on for many months. So often, um, we'd be there late at night, we would order in pizza, and we would fight over the last bar of chocolate in the vending machine. Right? The negotiations went on, we had paragraphs in, words in, paragraphs in and out, but eventually we had a consensus, right, to the relief and joy of everybody. Right. We had what's called the what is now called the sustainable, the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. It's a moral compass for the 21st, for the world for the 21st century. It is a policy blueprint that outlines pathways to sustainable livelihoods, inclusive societies, and sustainable environments. The one thing, the one big message I want to say to you is that people from all walks of life had an input into this process and into the negotiations. This agenda is truly an agenda that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. This is your agenda. At the core of the, at the, core of the agenda are 17 sustainable development goals. All, all of which have to be achieved by all, ni all nations by the end of 2030. Right. So, households everywhere will have access to basic nutrition, they will have access to education, to health, they will not face gender discrimination, they will have access to clean water, to, to sanitation, and sustainable energy. Companies across all countries will provide jobs for all. And when they invest, they will invest in sustainable societies and sustainable environments, and in addition to getting a decent rate of return on capital. Cities everywhere will be safe, resilient, inclusive. They will provide decent housing and jobs for all. Our common home, planet Earth, will be cared for. We will move to carbon neutrality. We will preserve our oceans and seas. We will halt the expansion of deserts. We will stop land degradation and we will prevent biodiversity loss. So while this may look like a global vision, and it was negotiated at a global level, but the implementation of this agenda has been given firmly back to the people. This is a global vision for local action, and that local action means you. But before I talk about 
how, how we can take some simple, uh, simple actions. We have to think about like, what is the root cause of the problems. Right. Economists, religions, all religions and scientists during this agenda came together and they identified two struggles that hum humanity have. Right? The first struggle is that we seem to be, the first trouble is, struggle is the, is the harm that we inflict on each other. We have a struggle with that. And our second is the harm we inflict on nature. So economists, just to help you understand how we do this, right, they want you to think of a woman. She's basically stranded on a desert island. Because she's bored, she sets up a company. She sets up a household. She sets up a government. Now, the thought experiment is, is that any action she takes as head of state, head of the government, or even head of the household, she would not knowingly harm herself or the environment around her. And if she had a family, she would want to leave that island. She would, want, she would not want to undermine uh, future generations, and she would want to leave that island in a sustainable way for her grandchildren. The world we live in, people are disconnected. We're in companies, we're in households, we're in governments, but we take actions that are driving a world where we're seeing it, huge social and economic inequalities, and we're also seeing harm to nature that is actually driving the quality of land, air, and water to a point that it's not even supporting human life. So how does the, if this is the problem, how does the UN 2030 agenda tell us to address this? Well, it's not surprising, they want multi-stakeholder partnerships, right? Partnerships between civil society, government, and the private sector to address these issues. So the UN has appointed what we call sustainable development advocates. There's Liam Messi, Shakira, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and the like. And the reality is, is that they need seven billion people on their team, right? if this agenda is to work. So let's go, go through examples of some actions that may, you may take. Right? In your home, review your energy use. Think about your food and waste management. Ask yourself, with my savings and pensions in the banks, where are they invested? Are they invested under the UN principles for responsible investment? In other words, are they going to harm any other government or society environment in any part of the world? Right. Ask yourself, what is my carbon and water footprint? Should I eat less? Eat less processed food? Should I eat less meat? Right. Companies, we are all part of companies. We buy products, we're either employees, we're shareholders, we're part of the board. They should be part of this agenda. Right? Have they signed up to the UN Compact to protect human rights around the world? Have they signed up to the UN Principles for Responsible Investment? Are they undertaking research and, and, uh, research and development and product development that is socially inclusive and environmentally responsible? And if they do, have they signed up to the UN Technology Facilitation Mechanism? This, this is to share these sustainable development technologies across all nations and people across the world. Um, in politics, these governments signed up to this agenda. And it's the onus on us as voters or political representatives or anybody who works in the public sector is to put the pressure on the, the, the nation states to implement the agenda. They need to be held to account. They need to deliver the future we want. Finally, in other walks of life, we all take part in theatres and, and music and sport. Right? We're all in schools and universities. They should be part of the agenda. Right? The snowflake never wants to take responsibility for what the avalanche does. Right? And in this case, if people come together, you would be surprised the snowball effects you can create on companies, on communities, and on governments. 
in conclusion, we need to be, and we can be the first generation to end poverty in all its forms by the end of 2030. The UN Sustainable Development Agenda depends on you. Is this its greatest strength or weakness? I would hope strength. To quote George Bernard Shaw, you see things and you say why, but I dream things that never were and I say why not. If you ask me, can we the people end poverty in all its forms before the end of 2030, I would say why not.